Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Monday night. Happy Poetry Palooza. We are here tonight for the finale of Morvan's first ever Poetry Palooza, our celebration of National Poetry Month. And we got started last week with an amazing program by Dr. Drew Lanham. I hope you all have had a chance to take a look at your recording and um, really enjoy that. And tonight we shift gears a little bit. And tonight we're gonna be, uh, we, we go from ornithology and the world of the birds uh, to women, poetry and war. And uh, tonight we're very excited because we have two professors from uh, Seton Hall University. We have Jeffrey Gray, who's professor emeritus at Seton Hall and Mary McAleer Balkan, professor of English at Seton Hall and a scholar of early American literature. Um, we're gonna travel uh, actually kind of from the uh, colonial times through the 21st century. And we're going to touch on the topics of women, poetry and war. So we're gonna begin with Dr. Gray and move mm -hmm. on to Mary Balkan. So without any further ado, Dr. Gray. Thank you, thank you for having us. I don't know if I can see everyone's face, but I see a few people there. Okay. Um, right, we're going to talk a little bit about the poetry of war, and, and that is the thing, there is such a thing. Um, it's, uh, for example, there's this uh, book by Lurie Goldenson called The American War Poetry, which in fact mm -hmm. covers the ground from uh, Mary's presentation in the 18th century to mine and at the present time. Um, I uh, had a couple of things to say. Uh, the idea of a poetry of a war might seem anomalous if you grew up in America in the 20th century, mm -hmm. because there actually wasn't that much poetry of war or poetry about collective events or traumas or what have you. Um, I'm not sure it was a big feature in the 18th century either, but we're gonna find out about that from, from Mary. But uh, the point about the 20th century is important because it wasn't that way all over the world, mm -hmm. in Russia, in Latin America, and in fact, mm -hmm. in places where it was often dangerous to write about um, political mm -hmm. events. That kind of poetry was written. Of course, the famous name there would be Pablo Neruda from Chile, but there are many, many other examples. Um, but this didn't occur in the United States for a large part. The only poem I can think of from World War I, for example, is Alan Seeger's poem, I Have a Rendezvous with Death. And in fact, he did die in World War I, as did the New Jersey poet Joyce Kilmer. But apart from that, the famous World War I poems, uh, poets are all British. Siegfried Sassoon, Rupert Brooke, and of course, Wilfred Owen. Uh, as for World War II, there's only one famous poem by an American, and that's Randall Jarrell's poem, The Death of the Ball Turret Gunner, which is in most American poetry anthologies, a grisly uh, but rather brilliant poem. So uh, what I'll get to later in this session today is uh, the fact that it's changed a lot. I mean, in 21st century, there's been an avalanche of social political poetry, poetry of all kinds, um, and there's no critical establishment against it as there once was in the 20th century. Some of this um, rising or return of the repressed might have been because of 9-11. And in fact, there are lots of essays and books on that phenomenon. Rather, I should say the literary reaction to that. And I'd be happy to mention titles or discuss that if you'd like to. Um, I thought we could begin with a very short poem, which I'm sure some of you know. Um, it's the poem by Emily Dickinson in the late 19th century. Um, which we won't cover today because, again, Mary's speaking of the 1700s and I'm in the 2000s. But the um, Emily Dickinson poem, uh, the first four lines read, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight. Art is truth's superb surprise. And this is, uh, is she talking about um, horrible truth or is she talking about brilliant, sublime truth like you're looking straight into the sun, you can't bear it. After all, the Bible says something like that, right? Uh, now we see through a glass darkly, but then we'll see face to face. Um, I think it became a rather a motto for 20th century poetry, um, telling it slant, being indirect, being oblique. And this is what characterized a lot of the poetry of the first half of the 20th century of modernism. In fact, so oblique and so indirect that after T.S. Eliot, Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, Marianne Moore, people who formerly liked poetry turned away from it. Uh, a lot of, um, some critics, I should say, uh, uh, though modernism was a great era, some critics do date the 
um, decline of the popularity of poetry to the modernists, since formerly, of course, people had read Kipling and Hausmann and so on uh, from the late uh, 19th century. Um, so this, um, this indirectness became a rather important thing. Uh, for us today, telling it slant is rather important as regards war poetry or any kind of poetry of trauma, loss, elegy, and so on. And um, it's been suggested that it's still kind of risky to write about things, these things, not because of any kind of government uh, fear. I don't think the government pays attention much to poets anymore, if they ever did, nor because of a critical establishment, but because it's so easy to go wrong. And um, a contemporary poet named um, Linda Gregerson writes about this. She says, one has to be careful simply because there are so many ghastly ways of going wrong. I'm always worried. I think it's essential to be worried about the possibilities of a trespass. We've all seen work that hitches an easy ride on the sufferings of others, that borrows intensity from large scale trauma only to reduce it to the scale of self. By the way, that very critique was applied, if you remember to Sylvia Plath, if you perhaps remember this poem of the 1960s, um, 50s and 60s, and um, people accused her of sort of ripping off Auschwitz, Dachau, Holocaust, Hiroshima, and so forth to, to add intensity to your own poetry. So, um, but at any rate, indirection has been the path of poetry for quite a while. Whether we see this in the 18th or the 20th century, there are periods when things do become more, I suppose, transparent and direct. But interestingly, the poets who are monuments to us now or have been at least for a long time from the modernist era are the indirect poets. Uh, and let's face it, the difficult poets, Pound and Eliot and Gertrude Stein and so on. Today's so-called language poets derive a lot from Gertrude Stein. Meanwhile, poets who were outrageously popular at the time, like Edna St. Vincent Millay, who was the poet of the jazz age, just as Fitzgerald was the novelist of the jazz age, are not much read, not much assigned, not much appearing on college syllabi. So that's first, and I want to make another comment with the idea that it might frame both um, Mary's discussion and mine, and that is, uh, where do we identify war poetry's turn from being celebratory and glorifying war to a much darker, bitter, uh, grisly kind of poetry? And I think of Walt Whitman in this connection, because Whitman wrote a book called Drum Taps during and after the Civil War, a war in which he served as a nurse and saw a lot of horror. And early in that book, you see poems with lines like, beat, beat drums, blow, bugles, blow. Oh, for a manly life in the camp and the sturdy artillery, the guns bright as gold. You know, isn't this gonna be fun? Uh, but then of course it's not. And later he writes poems. Um, he's got a poem, for example, called The Wound Dresser, where he says, from the stump of the arm, the amputated hand, I undo the clotted lint, remove the slough, wash off the matter. And a lot of such poems like that. Um, in this regard, the turn from, and this is my last point, from glory to gory, if you will, probably the key poem in the English language is not by an American, but by a British um, uh, soldier, uh, Wilfred Owen in World War I, who wrote a poem called Dulce et Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori. And I didn't think to project it for you because I just wanted to mention it in passing. It was the poem, the, the title's in Latin, Dulce e decorum est pro patria mori, which means something like sweet and fitting or becoming it is to die for one's country. But of course, um, the poem is about the opposite. It's about a mustard gas attack and the horrors, The and he describes it very vividly. I, I won't quote the lines, but, um, and it became a landmark um, for a turn in poetry. And by the way, in other, monuments. I mean, do we still have those equestrian, you know, glorifying generals with their soldiers, their swords high in the air? There's a few in Central Park in New York, but um, I don't know. Uh, there's, you, as you know, the Vietnam War Memorial is not like that at all. So this is a change, and um, whether it's changed people's ideas about war forever, I don't know, but it certainly expanded the range of what poetry was capable, capable of. So that's one thing we could also talk about, uh, whether a poem is endorsing or glorifying war in any way, or whether it's uh, uh, attacking it and in what ways it might do that. So I think here um, I should turn things to Mary and learn about Phyllis Wheatley and Anna Budno Stockton um, in the 18th century. So Mary, go ahead. 
Oh, I can't hear you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Okay, I had it on mute. Um, and um, thanks for the for the terrific introduction, not of me, of, of this, of the work we're doing. Um, we um, so as um, as Debbie mentioned, I'm I'm an early Americanist. My area is early American literature. Um, I do a lot of work in one of the two people I wanted to talk to you about this evening, um, Phyllis Wheatley, um, and um, I do teach um, Annis Budno Stockton. Uh, she's not somebody I've written about, but I uh, certainly know her work. Um, and I'm assuming that a lot of people who come to these things or are involved with Morgan also know her, her stuff. So um, we'll be spending a little bit more time on Phyllis Wheatley. Um, we started thinking about, about war and about uh, women who write about this. It just seemed like an interesting connection for the two of us, for, for, for me and Jeff. Um, so we're talking about 18th century women who would have really not had much of any experience of war per se, right? Um, and yet they do they do write war poetry. In fact, one of the things I've been interested in with Wheatley lately is the fact that people don't talk about her poetry, uh, things like To His Excellency General Washington and the other two poems we're going to take very quick looks at as war poetry, which it, it pretty clearly is. So what I've noticed is that uh, the, the women who are writing war poetry, and in this, in the case of both of these women, poems about the Revolutionary War, basically use uh, well-known national figures as ciphers, if you will. So they tend to write to uh, specific people or about specific well-known people from the period and use those as their vehicle to get into commentary about patriotism, about war itself, about their own situation in some cases. Um, more so with Wheatley, I would say, than with, than with Stockton. Um, so I also thought it was interesting that both Wheatley and Stockton have uh, poems to Washington. They both have poems on the capture of, of a military leader, and they both have elegies for military leaders. So there was an interesting kind of connection between these two women. So see if I can open this. It did work before. Um, with any luck at all. Oh, hold on a second. Wait, let me go back. Um, okay, hold on, hold on. Oh. It's jumping all over the place. So, all right, that's going to be a problem. Okay, hold on. Um, you know what? I may just have to open this from my Word documents. Might be the easiest thing to do. Yeah, this is the problem with Zoom. Okay. Um, actually, let me try in this mode. Up oh, there we go. Yeah, it doesn't like doing it when it's in showing mode. Let me see if that works. Okay, can you see that? Yes? No? Hello? No. Right, I, right now we PDF. just see um, your the bones of your program. Okay, so hold on one second. All right, so I'm going to, um, let me get out of here. I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, you know what? Maybe it'll do it this way. Well, it's not appearing yet. How about that? Oh yeah. Yes, now okay. we can see that. There you go. Okay. So and everyone's is... also received this in an email um, attachment today. So everyone has that if you want to open up your own right. copies. Yeah. Of it might be well. easier to see it in front of you. Thanks so much, Debbie. Yes. So and we're not going to spend a lot of time sort of pulling these poems apart. Um, but I just thought I'd, I'd touch on a few things about them. Um, so looking at three Wheatley poems, this to His Excellency General Washington on the capture of General Lee and on the death of General Wooster, which are considered now more recently, uh, they're referred to as her little Columbiad. Um, there are three poems that have typically been read separately, but actually do work together. And it seems like she expected them to be read together. In fact, Wheatley is credited with being the first person to use the word Columbia to refer to the emerging nation. Um, so uh, interesting little factoid there. So Wheatley is an enslaved woman. She is kidnapped from Africa when she is about seven years old, not sure exactly when, brought to Boston, purchased by the Wheatleys who educate her, give her a classical education um, at home, but a classical education. And she is um, fluent in Latin and Greek. She knows the classics inside and out. She knows the Bible inside and out. So she's um, exceedingly well-educated for a woman any woman of any, any uh, class at the time. Um, she is involved in the war in a number of ways. She corresponds with some of the famous figures of the war. So she actually writes this poem to Washington about Washington and sends it to him. And he gets it and writes back and says, you know, love to meet you. And they actually do arrange a meeting. He has a one hour meeting with her 
Um, and so she gets to meet him. She hears from John Paul Jones. She actually meets Benjamin Franklin. She's, she's really in communication with quite a wide array of people. So, um, but what I'm really interested in with her war poetry in particular is the way she can use it to make other kinds of points in, in some cases, um, more so as the poems go on, you'll see a real difference between this one and the next one. Um, she doesn't, so one of the points that Jeff and I basically came upon was that these women don't, they don't have experience of war, they don't fight, they haven't seen a battle. And so how do you write about war when you haven't actually experienced it? So what Wheatley and Stockton, well, Stockton comes a little closer when we'll get to her, but what Wheatley manages to do is she uses these, the, the classical literature she knows in order to paint a picture of war and to create this kind of poetic vision or image of war. Um, so Washington becomes this epic hero um, as does Wooster and so on. Um, and so, uh, and Stockton does something very similar. Um, but she, one of the, I, there are a few things I really like about this poem. She is able to look at it from the home front, if you will. So I'm gonna, I don't wanna scroll through it too much. Hopefully you have it in front of you. But she does have this idea of people watching from afar, right? Nations gaze at scenes before unknown. And she says, fixed are the eyes of nations on the scale. So this sense of watching what's going on. And she's one of the watchers, right? Uh, but she's also able to capture some of the chaos of war in this poem with lines like, let's see, enwrapped in tempest and a night of storms, astonished ocean feels the wild uproar. And then um, while round increase a little bit later on, while round increase the rising hills of dead. Again, not something she has seen, but she knows from her reading, here we go, um, uh, what, what war would be like. Um, the central figure in this whole poem is Washington, but, but she has a place as well in this poem. Um, she is a force of nature. She is, um, she talks about um, how um, the armies pour through a thousand gates. She aligns herself with this goddess of freedom that she creates at the beginning of this poem um, and the muse, Columbia, um, as well as, as herself as a poet. Um, and they're behind Washington, sort of rallying him on very much the way the women of Philadelphia would have rallied on the troops, right? Um, the goddess, in fact, returns at the end of this poem where the poet charges Washington, right? Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action, let the goddess guide. Mm -hmm. um, a crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine with gold unfading, Washington be thine. So the muse comes back in, at the, um, in the next poem that I'd like to look at, which is this poem to on the capture of General Lee. So let me see if I can get that one to open. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna try the same thing I did here. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. I'm gonna open it from here and then share it. Okay, um, let me see where we are. Okay, um, do, 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 new share, uh, here we go. That should do it, okay. So are you now seeing the General Lee poem? Yes. Yes. Okay, terrific, very good. All right, um, so I feel like she does the same thing in this poem about General Lee. The muse returns um, in this poem it, the, and the muse actually relates a conversation that she is essentially overhearing between Lee and his deceiver, the man who, who deceives him um, and captures him essentially. And the dialogue is even in quotation marks, which she does in a number of her poems, uh, something that people haven't really written about yet. She actually uses the same strategy in her poem on General Wooster. Um, so I'm gonna actually skip ahead to that one as well. Um, death of General Wooster, pull this open. And let me see, uh, I'm going to change, here we go, where is it, new share, general booster. Uh, it's up, it's up, up, it's up. Oh, it's up, good, it's okay, good. lovely. All right, so here with, with her death of general booster, she does something very similar. Um, but in this case, what really intrigues me about the general Wooster poem, so she's talking about war, she latches on to the main war figure of the revolution, Washington. She moves on to General Lee, who by the way, she doesn't seem to, understand a lot about the relationship. So her absence from the war becomes more evident in that she doesn't know some of the problems that General Lee 
is known for. He has not a very good relationship with Washington. That doesn't really come through in the poem. She just idolizes him as this captured hero. Um, Wooster, this is her elegy. Um, she's, she writes a lot of elegies, but so this is her, her elegy on this uh, war hero. But notice that what she does is starts to move more closely into criticizing other things and using the war. So to go back to the slant approach that Jeff was talking about early on. So not only do they take a slant approach to war, in this case, because they have no choice. They don't know war. They haven't seen war specifically, um, or Wheatley in, in particular here. But, um, but now she gets very overt in her connection between her own enslaved state and enslaved state of others around her and war. She actually says at one point, and she has this coming out of Wooster's, the mouth of this dying hero, but how presumptuous shall we hope to find divine acceptance with the almighty mind, while yet, O oh deed ungenerous, they disgrace and hold in bondage Africa's blameless race. Um, so to return to an earlier idea, Wheatley's war poetry is filled with phrases that sort of ring with this epic, heroic vision of war, not a very realistic vision, right? The fields of fight and a glorious conquest on the fields of war and so on. Um, I think you get a little bit more of what war would actually be like in Stockton's poetry. Um, so Stockton is, um, has a closer experience of war in that she is, um, her home is invaded. She loses her belongings. Um, it, the home becomes, uh, you know, a, a center um, for uh, British activity. Um, her husband is, is then made a prisoner and he's a prisoner for about a month, uh, apparently under really terrible conditions. And so, you know, she has at least a, a, like a closer relationship to the war than than Wheatley has. I mean, Wheatley never really sees where she is removed out of Boston. Um, the family does move out during during some of the as, as war gets closer, but she doesn't really have any any close sense of it. But Stockton does. I mean, Stockton's husband is deeply involved, right? He's a signer of the Declaration of Independence and all that. So her sense of war is very different. So she also writes poetry honoring um, Washington, right? Um, and she has this extended, um, you know, relationship through letters with him, uh, correspondence with him. Um, but she also does, in fact, use that position of being unequal to relaying the horrors of war, um, which again is pr pretty common in these. It, it goes a little beyond just the the modesty topos of, well, you know, I'm not good enough to be doing this. It really is a declaration of, you know, I. I just don't feel up to this task, right? How do I deal with this? Um, and so the two poems we're looking at are both addressed to Washington. Um, and so the first one of the two um, addressed to General Washington in the year 1777 after the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Um, all right, so let me see, uh, open this. Can you see that one? Yes. Okay, yes. terrific, good, okay. So, um, so in this case, she does in fact relate some of the horrors of war. And I think this is because it is the year after Morven is occupied and ransacked and taken over and so on. So she, I think has a better, a better sense of, of the, at least some of the horrors of war. So she writes, the muse of Friday at the clash of arms and all the dire calamities of war from Morven's peaceful shades has long retired, right? So she pulls her own experience in there and left her faithful votary to mourn in size not numbers or her native land, dear native land whom George's hostile slaves have drenched with blood and spread destruction round. I mean, except for the one mention of piles of dead in Wheatley, you don't really get that. And that's, and that's pretty graphic for a woman writing in this period. Right? Um, she also sympathizes with Washington's hardship and his losses, again, things she herself would have experienced, right? Having been forced out of her home, everything she loses as a result. She does write in this poem, ah, uh, who can paint the horrors of that morn? But she doesn't say, I can't. Basically, she's saying no one can, right? So, so it's kind of interesting that in this early poem, this earlier of the two poems, she does feel more competent to, sort of, to say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not alone in not being able to do this. In the next poem, however, uh, to George Washington from Annis Budino Stockton, this is actually included in a letter that she, which a lot of her poems are. They're actually included in letters um, let me see, uh, I'm going down to this one. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, we, don't, we don't see it 
Yeah. Okay, no, I just pulled it up. Can you see it now? Yeah, but we only do see the first couple of lines. Oh, okay. So I have to figure out, okay, I'm going to have to, hold on one Maybe second. Maybe scroll a little bit. Okay, yeah. If I scroll down, can you see it now? We can just see a few more lines. I don't know if you can make your screen, um, mm. you know, enlarge. If not, just, you know, the way it's been going, it's fine. Okay, you can thanks. Scroll as you're yeah. talking, right? Because we only see about eight lines at a time. Yes. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, otherwise I figured if I made it too small, then generally people will say they can't read it because it's too tiny. So <laughs> it's sort of six, one half dozen or the other. Um, so let me see. All right, so in the second poem, she does in fact say, uh, let me see. She says, say, can a female voice an audience gain and stop a moment thine triumphal car? And will thou listen to a peaceful strain, unskilled to paint the hard scenes of war, right? So this poem is written after peace has been declared, which makes me wonder if at this point in her life, she's also starting to be more aware of public opinion, um, especially there are some questions that have arisen about um, her husband's loyalty to the revolutionary cause, you know, he does sign, apparently he signs a loyalty oath to George. I mean, no, it's all kind of uncertain what happens there. Um, certainly he is tortured, it seems. But anyway, she does seem to be doing a lot of work. And in this poem in particular, I feel like she's doing work to recuperate his reputation. And she's going through the main person she feels can do that, who is Washington. Um, so she also says, um, I find it interesting that she she gets Stockton is actually criticized for whitewashing the, the war to a great extent in her poems um, and making it seem as if everyone was on the same side we were all in this together there were never any questions of loyalty I mean you can make the same criticism about Wheatley as well um, so I don't think it's fair to just say it about one person but I I do find it really interesting the way these these two poems the shift that happens in them um, and that there's definitely, I'm gonna end here. So hopefully I haven't gone too far over Jeff, <laughs> that there's definitely, um, the you see the buildings of a national myth in here with our national heroes. What is it the myth is about? It's about triumph. It's about triumphing over terrific odds. Um, it's about, and, and Wheatley is trying to push it toward a narrative of freedom for all. Um, Stockton is trying to push it toward peace because peace is what's going to let us move beyond some of the terrible things that might've happened. Can we push this behind us and move forward? Um, so anyway, I, more we can talk about with, with these poems, um, but we're gonna, move, we're going to move on to Jeff. All right, let me see what I can do here. Unmute myself here. Okay. Um, you know, I wonder because there's a kind of a trope that happens in poetry. It happens in elegy a lot. You see it in Milton's Lycidas Mm -hmm. where he says, I can't quote the lines, but he says something like, you know, poetry is inadequate, words are inadequate, I'm inadequate to deal with this horror, with this loss, and so forth. So there's a kind of a turn that poets do. I think of oh. Othello, you know, Othello saying, rude am I in speech and unpracticed in anything except the arts of war, when in fact he's not rude in speech at all, he's eloquent. But her saying that I'm unskilled to paint the horrid scenes of war, would you think that some of that modesty is gender related or do you think mm -hmm. something that a male poet would have done as well or are there male poets at this time writing more explicitly or perhaps not i don't know oh mary you're muted mary you have to unmute yourself i am okay so i wasn't now I'm, all right now i'm unmuted again um yeah i mean you know, there are definitely men writing in this period about about war um, i'm writing more overtly about it um yeah i i'm it's definitely gender related. And I think especially with Stockton's, um, again, gender is less of an issue for Wheatley because being enslaved is a bigger issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with Stockton, I'm, I think there's much, there's more of this modesty that comes out in the later poem. I think as her poetic reputation is growing and also as, you know, in more time you can get away with a lot more. But now that we're moving into peacetime and she is trying to kind of re-establish herself um, and, and she's, getting, she's getting a growing reputation. There's definitely much more of a modesty impulse in, in the second of the two poems. And yeah. in her later poetry in general, I think. I think in the first one, she's really, really, really pissed. <laughs> yeah. She's really mad and it's coming through. And yeah. later on, there's more of a sense of, okay, oh, you, know, you know, would you even listen to a she? Can a woman even, can, can, will you even entertain what she has to say? That's yeah. very different. So yeah, it's definitely gender related. 
Well, um, I'm always thinking of these different ways that people find to, to not necessarily evade or skirt an issue, but to metaphorize or to be oblique in one way or another. Mm -hmm. The poems I'm going to look at uh, are all contemporary poems, or more or less contemporary. Maxine Cuman died a few years ago. Uh, her name is pretty famous. She and Sexton were together back in the days. They took um, mm. classes from Robert Lowell at Boston University together. They were housewives together who became poets uh, mm -hmm. in a time when, um, uh, well, it was long after the Roaring Twenties, uh, uh, but it's about 30 years later. But um, they, uh, and Sexton was the outrageous one, of course. Her, she and Platt became the most famous confessional poet. Cuman became known, and she didn't necessarily like it, she became known as Roberta Frost. You know, she, she was writing these nature poems, and they were beautiful, and they're wonderful <laughs> poems. But toward the end, in the last 20 to 30 years, she started writing much more confrontational poems about the war in Iraq and so forth. And um, uh, in particular, she wrote some poems about torture. And um, the, um, the one we were going to look at, Extraordinary Rendition, is one of those. So um, she, and I want to quote her here. She says, I reached a point in my life where it would be easy to let down my guard and write simple imagistic poems, but I don't want to write poems that aren't necessary. I want to write poems that matter, that have an interesting point of view. And she also says that uh, 20 years ago, I thought Denise Levertov was wrong in writing political poems, that she'd lose her lyrical impulse, but I've changed my mind. So she had several poems then, and um, I'm adding one, and it's very short, so I don't, I don't think um i think we'll have time it's about it's a funny thing because if you hadn't known about waterboarding under bush and cheney and i don't know if it's happening at the present guantanamo or not but if you just heard waterboarding you might think oh yes snowboarding surfboarding skateboarding sure there must be something called waterboard so her she's involved in looking at language military language military euphemisms military justifications uh, governmental justifications and so on. And I thought this poem was very interesting because her editor had advised her to take it out of her collection, the last collection she had, which was, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the title of her. Um, oh, I can't remember the set of her last connection. I think it's still to mow. Oh yeah, still to mow. I don't know if that means that she has some grass still to mow in her yard or what. But uh, so eventually this poem, which her editor advised her to take out, was restored. So the poem is now called Waterboarding Restored, and I don't have it to project, but it's short and simple, basically, and it ties in with the one we will look at in just a moment. So the poem reads, let's take this one out, my editor said, my wise old editor who rarely invoked her privilege. Two years from now, it takes that long to go from manuscript to print, no one will even remember the word. And so I did. That is, I took it out. It began you're thinking summer, theme parks, a giant plastic slide, turquoise and pink, water streaming down its sinuous course, and clots of screaming children pouring past in a state of ecstasy while you sip gin and tonic with friends. Now, under the shellac of euphemism, they're calling it enhanced interrogation. It follows on the heels of extraordinary rendition. Only the mockingbird is cleverer, warbling blithe lies from his tree. The last two lines kind of put her back in the Roberta Frost category because she's still writing about nature at the end there, sort of mockingly. You know, I didn't think I'd heard a mockingbird on the West Coast. I, uh, they must be there, right? But when I came out here, I heard mockingbirds all the time. Uh, and uh, so they're lying, right? They're pretending to be some other kind of bird or even insect, apparently. But it introduces two terms, both euphemistic, both lies, enhanced interrogation and then Extraordinary Rendition. So if you don't mind, I, we could turn to Extraordinary Rendition now. And uh, we do have this available to project. You should um, see it. Are you seeing it? No, I'm seeing No, we're it. not. We're still seeing the um, Annis's poem. OK, yes. hold on yeah. one second. Yeah. All right. It's OK. I'll, I'll, no, no, it's up. Uh, it's like here we go. Yeah. Let's try this. But um, I wonder, um, it's not this is there it is. Alaska. OK, Thank it's there now. Much. This is where I'd ask a class, you know, does anybody know what extraordinary rendition was? But these are funny words. I mean, rendition, of course. Well, what's your rendition of uh, Stardust or, you know, uh, by the time I get to Phoenix or something? Your rendition is your version of a song, right? 
and also to rend, to claw yourself. You know, she goes into all these things. And I'm just so curious about this, how contemporary poets, a lot of poets seem to be doing this, to getting inside language, even within their, their own poem. But in this case, official language, governmental language. And here too, I can refer you to articles about this phenomenon. So what it means, if you, to just remind everybody, is of course, if, if, if the law or the Geneva Convention prevents you torturing, you, the government, you can send the, the, the prisoner to some other country where you know he will be tortured. That's what extraordinary rendition was. Um, so I'll, I'll read the poem. Um, because here again, it's nature, going back and forth from nature to these boys who've been captured in Iraq. Only the oak and the beech hang onto their leaves at the end. The oak leaves bruised, the color of those insurgent boys, Iraqi policemen captured, purpling their eyes and cheekbones before lining them up to testify to the Americans that no, no, they had not been beaten. The beech leaves dry to brown, a palette of cinnamon. They curl undefended. They have no stake in the outcome. Art redeems us from time, it has been written. Meanwhile, we've, we've exported stress positions, shackles, dog attacks, sleep deprivation, waterboarding. To rend, and now it seems almost like she's in a dictionary, to tear one's garments or hair, in anguish or rage, to render, to give what is due or owed. The Pope's message this Sunday is the spiritual value of suffering. Extraordinary how the sun comes up, a little misprint there, how the sun comes up with its rendition of daybreak, staining the sky with indifference. This echoes a lot of things. I mean, I always think about nature being indifferent, indifferent rather. Uh, W.H. Auden's famous poem, Musée des Beaux-Arts, well, where Icarus is falling from the sky, but the ship turns away because it has somewhere else to go and is not particularly interested. And this irony here too, I mean, art redeems us from time. Well, does it? Um, that's what people say. I think she's putting that in ironic quotes. I don't think she believes it. And the Pope today is saying, well, there's a spiritual value to suffering. Well, of course. Uh, so these are the uh, palliatives and the excuses that people give us to endure suffering or to do, endure others' suffering, which is much easier. So it's, a, it's an, quite an amazing poem. It's investigating the language at the same time that it's going back and forth from the rough, beautiful autumnal colors. And the oak leaves do seem bruised, reddish, bluish. Are they bluish, bluish and yellowish? Uh, and then she's looking at these boys who've been beaten in their cheekbones and so forth. Um, seeming to turn to nature as romantic poetry does as a consolation, but not really finding any consolation hearing the consolations of others like the poem and not really accepting them. And then working in the two words in the last three lines with her return to her Roberta Frost role, extraordinary how the sun comes up with its rendition of daybreak. Um, so she did a book of such poems and um, in that, I think the section of that book still to mow. Now I included a poem to discuss here or to look at at least which is rather difficult. And I included it for that reason, uh, not to read it all the way through, but just to, again, talk about um, how language is investigated. And that's what she does. Apparently, armed services hearings are open to the public. You can go and sit in a hearing, not, I suppose, in certain other kinds of meetings, but hearings are open to the public. I'm not sure if you have to apply or not, or whether she just walked in. But she has written about this. and. Um, and by the way, these poems, uh, some of these poems are in a book that uh, I co-edited with Ann Keniston called The New American Poetry of Engagement. And um, in here, um, this poet, um, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce her name. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Hillman. Hillman, Brenda Hillman. So sorry. <laughs> Brenda Hillman is actually a rather famous uh, She's, she's part of a huge poetic power couple, if you will. Robert Haas is her husband. He was poet laureate for quite a while. And um, I think she's a more mysterious and amazing poet, but he's, um, he's certainly a, uh, a great poet as well. But her poetry is, is kind of weird. And um, she's an unusual person, I think. She maybe earns the title that people use recklessly of a visionary, kind of a Blakeian visionary, somebody who actually sees things and finds things in her dreams and so forth. So in this book, there's some statements by poets about the poems. And she says a couple of things. For example, materials for the poem 
come from the unconscious and how she's always admired occult forms of knowledge and how she uses trance techniques to visit the blue cave and the yellow tablets, whatever those are. Uh, now that's pretty, pretty far out, pretty visionary, pretty mediumistic or spiritualist compared to the rather mundane stuff that's being discussed in Washington, D.C. at a Senate Armed Services hearing. So, um, so she says the source material for several of these poems is the public record, and this is an example of it. And she talks about Osama bin Laden and so forth. But um, I just want to point out that curious mix. Now, the other thing to say about this is there the subjectivity seems to be floating around, perhaps like Whitman's does when he inhabits different bodies in his poems. But the first line is from my position as a woman. And later we find uh, from my position as a fly, from my position as a thought, from my position as a molecule and so forth. So it's rather unusual just to orientate us. I'll, I'll read a few lines and then say a couple of more general things. From my position as a woman, I could see the back of the general's head, the prickly intimate hairs behind his ears, the visible rimless justice raining down from the eagle on the national seal, the eagle's claw held pack of arrows and its friends. A fly was making its for sure maybe algebra cloud in the Senate chamber. It felt to us to see how senators reshuffled papers, the pity of the staples, to sense when someone coughed after the about to be czar general said, I don't foresee a long roll for our troops, and so on. And then you'll see a couple lines down from its position on the table. The fly could then foresee the soon to be smashed goddess as in Babylon. And now we're in Babylon. We're in Mesopotamia. And she mentions the goddess Ishtar. Well, this is Iraq. I mean, it wasn't called Iraq then, but Mesopotamia included Iraq and Turkey and Syria. And I think crept into other lands as well. Um, it doesn't exist, of course, as a, a state or an entity today. So the goddess of Ishtar is there in the place with, where we're wreaking havoc, havoc uh, the US and the Iraqis. Um, and the fly sees this and the fly hears and she hears and they're casual sort of numb passive phrases. Well, general, I'd be interested to know and give breathing space for the new general to unoccupy and, and so forth. So it's, a, it's an unusual poem and it's drift, but it's also focused in the sense that she's there on the spot, she's reporting. But, and yet the poem drifts in a very dreamlike way. Um, I'll read the last few lines. She's got this odd typographical thing. You can see it right there around the word safety and around the word A, the letter A. Um, so here's where language becomes the focus again, if it hasn't been all the way through. Uh, let's see, the last oh, six lines or so. The breath they used when saying A for American interests made the A stand still. It had a sunset clause. They tried to say safety, but the S withdrew. The S went underground, would not be redeployed, refused to spell, till all the letters stopped in astral light in dark love for their human ones. Well, I, I like poems that kind of mystify me, and this one does. By the way, the emblem at the end there uh, didn't exist in the copy uh, that we got from her when we anthologized the poem. So I'm not sure whether and this, uh, I've got the same thing that Mary's showing there. Uh, this, um, what do you call that when they put a line over something like no, no crossing here or something? It's got the negative sign on top of the government seal. Um, so I, to me, these are examples of a kind of, if you will, anti-government, challenge to the government, kind of confrontational counterculture sort of poem, I suppose, but not inflammatory like Amory Baraka or other poets who have written in a, in a intense way about the war and its ravages, but rather trying to get inside the heads and inside the language of the people mounting the war. Um, if you will, I just have um, one last poem to look at. And uh, it's from, a, again, a really very famous poet, um, Sharon Olds, who I think is still at New York University, though I, I'm not positive. Um, She's written many, many books. She's written very, very personal books of poetry, very mm -hmm. revealing, very confessional, you might say, mm -hmm. along the lines of those poets of the 60s and 70s, like Robert Lowell mm -hmm. and Sylvia Plath and others. Mm -hmm. But this is my, my exhibit A. This is my main argument for the turning away. Look at the title, September 2001, New York City. 
doesn't say September 11th, and September 11th is never mentioned. But in the first two lines, she writes, a week later, I said to a friend, I don't think I could ever write about it. She doesn't say what it is we're supposed to know. Probably we do know from looking at that title. So the whole poem is about this trying to tell something as in, um, was the last poem we looked at Wheatley's or Stockton's? It was Stockton's, right? Mm -hmm. When she said, I don't think I can, what did she right. say? I can't paint the, this image. So here too, um, the difficulty of talking about it. And then she goes somewhere else. The poem goes somewhere else. I, I would invoke one more metaphor for this, and that is Hemingway's iceberg effect, so famous. We see something being told, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. The rest of it's ominously out of view uh, in the realm of the unconscious. But I, this one I will I'll read all the way through, if you don't mind. A week later, I said to a friend, I don't think I could ever write about it. Maybe in a year I could write something. There is something in me, maybe someday all those qualifiers, something, maybe, someday, to be written. Now it is folded and folded and folded like a note in school. And in my dream, someone was playing jacks. And in the air, there was a huge throne tilted jack on fire. And when I woke up, I found myself counting the days since I had last seen my ex-husband. Only a few years and some weeks and hours. We had signed the papers and come down to the ground floor of the Chrysler building. And here she describes it, and if you've seen it probably, and it describes the kind of art deco, the intact beauty of its lobby around us like a king's tomb, on the ceiling, the little painted plane and the mural flying. And it entered my strictured heart this morning, slightly, shyly, as if warily, untamed, a greater sense of the sweetness and plenty of his ongoing life, unknown to me, unseen by me, unheard by me, untouched by me but known by others, seen by others, heard, touched. And it came to me for moments at a time, moment after moment, to be glad for him that he is with the one he feels was meant for him. And I thought of my mother, minutes before her death, 85 years from her birth, the almost warbler bones of her shoulder under my hand, the eggshell skull as she lay in some peace in the clean sheets. And I could tell her the best of my poor partial love I could sing her out with it. I saw the luck and the luxury of that hour. Well, I remember first reading this and I just think it's an incredible and moving poem, but it's of course, I guess it's about September 2001 in her life, but we can't forget those opening lines that she's going to write about it, but, but not yet. And I think I may have a statement by her as well about this poem. Um, just here it is. Yes. Um, so I was not up to this subject. And she even thought she wasn't going to write poems anymore. And um, the possible usefulness of any poem of mine was so small. There's again that kind of humility, but I think it's not just a gesture of convention, um, it sounds like a, the real thing. Um, and then she had this strange dream about the jacks and the plane in the air, and then she kept putting off the poem. And late, then she wrote it and she said, later I found myself willing to read it to others. And I guess I was willing because it wasn't a brag. It had something to do with gratefulness to fate and with a sense of others' sufferings being beyond my imagining. Um, and I don't think I had, much beyond this except to say I really would uh, invite an interpretation of this poem or others. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll make a last comment and then uh, ask if anyone would like to comment on this poem. I, um, the one thing that's absolutely indisputable about poetry in the last century or more is that it's become very, very hard to define. We see the heroic couplets of Wheatley's poems or of Stockton's poems and uh, they are obvious, uh, the iambic pentameter, the rhymed couplets, and so forth, and the invoking of the gods of Greece and Rome and so forth, which was convention. Uh, it was just thick with convention, and that was the way one wrote. Wordsworth eventually objected to that, arguing for plain speech, and then you read Wordsworth and you think, seriously, that's plain speech? Uh, so, well, then we undid it further and further and further. So I would say in this regard, Sharon Olds' poem is kind of conventional, 
that is, it's a typical 20th century, though it's written in the 21st, uh, conversational, ordinary language kind of poem without, of course, meter or form. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the lines have pretty much evaporated now between poem, poetry, whether free verse or metrical, and narrative and anecdote and essay. And uh, as a last example of political poetry, I would just mention this book um, by Claudia Rankine, which has enjoyed a huge amount of fame, which I taught for several years, called Citizen. And it, it's a, it won a lot of awards for poetry, and yet there's very little of what we'd usually call poetry in it. Most of it is anecdote. That's another topic, I guess, but I'll, I'll stop there. And I don't know, Debbie, do we have um, well, do we have time for comments from anyone? We sure do. I have uh, two in the chat. And thank you both so much. It was really, the presentation so far has been mesmerizing. Um, yeah. But so one quote, we'll start uh, chronologically. So Anna Stockton corresponded quite prolifically with Washington and visited. Did Phyllis Wheatley ever meet Washington? Yes. Yeah, she met him once. Yeah, um, he arranged to have her um, meet with him. Um, I forget exactly where he was stationed. Um, Probably Starbucks. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, they yeah no they worked out. It, it was a one hour meeting. She was last. She yeah. He he invited her to meet with him, and so they did work out. They worked out a, a time and a place to meet. So yeah, she's actually met him. That yeah. that to me is absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, just in general, well, having an his audience. response, yeah, his response to her was so much more gracious. Well, I see again, I don't know how much you know, but you know, so Wheatley had become quite famous in her day. She had a book of poetry published um, and Thomas Jefferson had even heard about her, but he was frankly sort of an, an ass. <laughs> he, his comment was um, that, you know, so there's a certain amount of religion that, that basically Blacks, Africans can have, um, but you know they can have this kind of spirit. They can have the kind of imagination, but they can never be poets. And so he just completely dismissed her poetry at her. <laughs> oh and then God. there was this test, right? There was this. Well, test. yeah, they go back and forth on whether that actually happened to oh, yeah, oh. The, the testimony of the seventeen upstanding citizens. Yeah, yeah, he wrote that though in notes on the state of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've read it, you can find his rather snarky comment about Phyllis Wheatley. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, that the test of, of, of these, um, to, to verify that she actually knew her stuff and right. she knew all the, you know, right, the, the classical literature and so on. So yeah, interesting. So, so another question now mm -hmm. we, we, um, we switch over to Jeffrey's mm -hmm. presentation. So um, a person posted, please post the Sharon Olds poem, the whole poem, so I can print it. So I will do that. I will send that out to everyone. Um, but another question here in Maxine Cumin's poem, is it possible that the oak leaves she references are really referencing the oak cluster of a major, the armed forces, rather than a nature reference? Mm. You know, I wouldn't have thought of that. I have to tell you, I wouldn't have thought of that. I. Um... Some, I don't know why I kind of doubt it, but I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's not around to tell us anymore, but uh, you know, she's living, in, she lived on a horse farm actually. And uh, she, um, she has just lots and lots of beautiful nature poems. So she was a mm -hmm. close observer. Certainly she was a close observer in this poem of those, um, of those leaves. And now I've lost the poem, I had it right in front of me. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I, it just didn't occur to me. So the answer is, I, I don't know. Yeah. Now, the oldest poem should have been the last one in the document that I sent you, Debbie, that had all the poems in it. So it's the whole thing should be in there. Right. If not, I can resend. But I thought right. no, I, I will one. make sure. Okay. They should have all been in the one PDF. Yeah. I'll make sure that I send it to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, ah, OK. And another question. I missed how Phyllis Wheatley got her super education. Please repeat. Oh, well, um, so the Wheatleys um, realized apparently how smart she was. Um, she learned English very quickly. They just educated her at home. They educated her along with um, one of their sons and one of their daughters who were learning. Um, they gave her free reign um, to the library. Um, and so, yeah, they just, they, they, I think basically she was being taught by the same tutors as the son and the daughter were, and the son and the daughter were also helping her along the way. So yeah, she learned at home, but they did too, you know, the way most people would have done. Fascinating. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I have a great image of her. I don't know if I can, I should, I, do people know what she looks like? Um, sort of interesting. I was gonna, going to pull this up and then I didn't. Um, but go ahead with your other question. Oh, here we go. I can pull it up now. So this is what she looked like. This is from the frontispiece of her book, um, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, and then more to come. And what I love about this image is not just that she's writing and she's thinking, but love in the ironic sense is the way around the outside of it, it makes it very clear what her status is. So with Phyllis Wheatley, Negro servant to Mr. John Wheatley of Boston. Mm. Do we know who the artist was? Uh, we think it was Scipio Moorhead. Yeah, mm. um, they're not positive because it's not signed, but it seems like it might, it might have been. Uh, he was also, he was a, a black artist. So it, yeah, it might not have, it would, he seems likely as the as the the it's a lithograph so uh -huh. yeah um yeah but fascinating right all right i'm gonna stop sharing there okay well i oh was she a slave at that yeah. time yeah in fact she wasn't freed until after the book came out um so what happens is um the, the wheatleys also arranged for the book to be published um and she um after the book is published, it's published in London. It's actually supported by um, the Countess of Huntingdon, who becomes a sponsor and helps to get it published. She, um, the, the British press in particular, starts pushing for her manumission. She's still owned. And when she comes back, she's not actually freed um, until about a year, two years later. Uh, Susanna dies. And when she dies, she, she is freed. Um, and so she's given her freedom then. But what she's... year are we talking about at that point? Oh my goodness. Um, let me Roughly. Think. Um, 17, I'm trying to think it's gotta be, it's later because um, she's still a slave. Much of this is going on. Um, yeah, I have to tell you, I'm really, really bad with dates. <laughs> um, yeah, let me think about it for a second. <laughs> um, You're Googling it? Yeah, I am. I am. I can't remember the year she was freed. Um, 1776 or so, it should have been. Oh, that's a good wow. 1775 is when her book is published. And so it's that's 1775. So it's like the next year in like February or so um, that, that she is freed. And she doesn't live much long. She lives a few years after that. Um, she does marry. And the big push now has been to be to give her her married name too and call her Phyllis Wheatley Peters. And we people go back and forth with that because she published under Wheatley uh, for most of her things. There are a few things she published under Peters, one of them being the elegy on German Wooster that she published as, as Phyllis Peters. So she does publish a few things later on, but it was hard to get a book published in those days. You needed to be able to get um, subscriptions. People needed to agree to buy the book before any publisher would take it on. Um, so with the Wheatleys and with the Countess, she had some real supporters but after so the mrs wheatley dies then then mr wheatley dies and then one of the daughters dies and she is kind of left her own devices so um yeah it becomes her the end of her life is very sketchy some people have been very very hard on john peters who married her other people have said he was a good guy so trying to eke all that out how do you feel about it you know i think I think he probably got a bum rap. They talked about her dying in poverty and dying alone and dying in childbirth. We just, we just don't know. Um, but I think um, she did continue to write. Apparently there was another manuscript that she was trying to get published, another book of poems and um, it vanished. So, which is also, you know, distressing, but you never know. You never know. And, Stuff and pops up all the time. Peters was black, right? Black, yes, yes, he was free and he was black. And apparently he was a, an entrepreneur and a good businessman, but you know, trying to try to be a good black businessman at the end of the 18th century is, yeah. um, you know, challenging. So yeah, yeah, she's, she's really a fascinating figure. And so the question came up here, did she have money of her own? She had a little bit of money. She actually did because um, there's, a, there's a notice in fact, um, that she actually contributed like seven shillings to the war effort, <laughs> which I thought is just marvelous. Isn't that right about all these people who gave 500 pounds and 200 pounds and she gave her seven shillings, but you know, she gave seven shillings, that's great. <laughs> so 
Yeah. Yeah. No, she did. She had a little money, but, but once she and uh, Peters were on their own, again, the, 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 it just vanishes. You know, there's really not a lot of evidence. Um, there is a new biography about her though. Um, I have it. Um, it's uh, Vincent Coretta is one of the big uh, scholars on, he's probably the leading scholar on Wheatley. And he just put out a, it's called G biography of a genius in bondage. And this is not meant facetiously. I mean, there's, there's good evidence that she actually was a genius. I mean, Can she you hold learned, that up? Can you hold that the book up for a second? There she you. learned Latin and Greek in a matter of two years and became fluent. Huh. Um, and so there's real, there's real reason. And I'll tell you one other book you might want to think about. And this one is fabulous. This just came out last year. So this is called The Age of Phyllis, and it's by um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers. It is a poetic reimagining of Wheatley's life. Um, but she's done, she did like 12 years of research on Wheatley to, to produce this book. It's a book of poetry. Now it looks like it's won an award. We can't see what award. Yes, oh, it won the National Book Award. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was on the long list for the National Book Award. Mm -hmm. It did. I think it won. Might have won the Booker Prize. I'm um, trying to think. It has won awards. Yes, yeah, so it was on the long list for the National Book Award. Um, looking to see what else it is on here. Well, on the little um, circle, the little silver circle. Yeah, yeah, that's the National Book Award National long, list. Board, long yeah. list. Yeah, but um, yeah, this is also wonderful. It's wonderful. So the age of Phyllis, and notice the spelling. I mean, that is the right spelling of the name. <laughs> I. <laughs> I always have to correct it. So, well, I, I always like to ask my um, guests if there, if there are any final thoughts you have mm. you want to share. So, I'll start with Jeffrey. Jeffrey, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with us tonight? Well, I, I just keep thinking of our, our topics, which are never quite resolved. There's, um, mm. you know, there's a famous, uh, um, probably the most famous Marxist literary critic who, who says, of course, that everything is political. I'm thinking of Frederick Jameson. And he's absolutely right. You can watch, I don't know, some silly sitcom and it has political undertones, it has political meaning and the simplest lyric and so forth. So there's a lot of people who say that, hey, wait a minute, all poetry is involved in political life. But I don't think so. I mean, if we're gonna be, if the word is gonna have any meaning at all, mm -hmm. uh, I think that, um, you know, I'm sort of watching more attentively lately contemporary poetry mm -hmm. since I used to write about post-war poetry, especially the, 60s and 70s and uh, those poets, but um, it's uh, it seems to me that the reception has changed completely. So uh, this has no bearing on the 17th century, the 1800s rather. I'm sorry, 1700s. Mm -hmm. But of, about today, that the critical establishment, uh, if there is one, uh, has changed a lot, and the readership has changed a lot. I think you know whether for good or ill, things are going a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked me yesterday whether I liked Amanda Gorman, and she's the young woman who read at um, the last mm -hmm. at Biden's election. And I haven't liked anybody who's read at an inaugural, except, and not even Robert Frost, who read at, uh, at Kennedy's, because he read the, the Gift Outright, which is a very problematic poem, and nobody, I don't think, would stand for it today. But um, there's a kind of uh, more rhetorical and didactic poetry coming now and there's much more emphasis on performance and spoken word and so forth so i'm just watching this develop trying not to have judgment on it either way i think poetry in print is going in even more i guess obscure ways uh than than what we thought was obscure you know 50 years ago or so mm. uh, so these i mean these are just sort of my ongoing observations uh, I guess today hearing uh, Mary talk about those about Wheatley and Stockton makes me want to go back and read more. Um, I'm 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 struck by how crammed they are with classical allusions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a colleague named David Shields. So this couple of people named David Shields. This is the less famous one, but whose whole thing was no noting how classical, how how the language of antiquity fits into early American poetry. So mm -hmm. that interests me. Yeah, but no, uh, no other comments for me. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's funny you brought you where you ended up. Um, as you were talking about language, Jeff, I started, you're right, and, and all of the um, the classical allusions. I feel like the poetry of the 18th century, especially these poems, it's really more thick. <laughs> it's yeah. thick language. I mean, yeah. it's not language as revelatory, it's language almost as a barrier. 
Um, you have to, I mean, in some of the same ways, I guess people would have said about, about modern poetry, but, but in a different way. But if you don't get the classical illusions, if you haven't had, well, that's part of it too, right? For Wheatley, she needs to prove her, her writing chops and her, mm -hmm. her poetic chops and her intellectual chops. So she, her stuff is laden with all of this learning that she's acquired. Right. Uh, well, she's also writing in a neoclassical tradition, which is what's popular at the time, right? I mean, that's this right. is what... It was what everybody would have been using. Uh, she's modeling herself on Alexander Pope in particular and those writers. Um, but it's still, it's it's not poetry that's um, that's easy to get through, especially now when we don't necessarily have that kind of classical education. Um, and, um, you know, as far as other war poets, you had asked before, I mean, Philip Freneau was writing it, but oh. honestly, a lot of the revolutionary war poetry came later in the 19th century came from oh. Wordsworth and, and Emerson even and Bryant, right? Um, they're not, most of the stuff being written by men in the 18th century about the war is uh, prose or essays and right. that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and again, I think these women have this connect, they, they make this personal connection to these individuals, whether in person or just through having known them. I mean, you know, Wheatley hears about Wooster dying, and so she writes the poem, this elegy in his honor, and so on. Um, so it's not always a personal connection, but a lot of her poetry is about people, is about individuals, and actually, so is Stockton's. It's a lot of the poetry they write is a, are about individuals. So um, again, I think it's it tends to be a largely female thing in this period. Uh -huh. But anyway, so that's, I would leave it there. But I hope uh, hope this was interesting. I, I learned a lot. Say, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I would say one more thing, and that is that I, um, you know, at the time Stockton and Wheatley are writing, the Romantic Revolution hasn't happened. Well, mm -hmm. you know, French Revolution is about to happen, 1789, mm -hmm. and the American one is happening in 1776. But the worldwide, uh, and the, the emergence of the poet as a romantic, as, as a troubled tortured rebellious genius which which you know has lasted through rock stars and movie stars all the way from byron and shelley and keats to the present mm -hmm. that was completely unknown in the 18th century if you were going to write you were going to write like pope i assume mm -hmm. and uh so this is not probably the place to look for someone saying i'm going to take down the establishment or something mm -hmm. right. <laughs> in, in yeah, poetry. No. No. Uh, so I'm going to just, since uh, Jeffrey mentioned that he wants to start, you know, reading again, this is um, Anna Stockton's book that we do okay. in our shop. Can you see it? Oh, and good, I, put the, good. So I put, it's only for, uh, only for the eye of a friend. Yep, Carla um, Mulford. She's an old her, friend. We have her book of poetry in our shop. So I put the link in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have a message here. One of our viewers, Martha Otis said her ancestor, Mercy Otis Warren, wrote poetry that was like a classical rather stiff style have you ever heard about her of course yes absolutely her, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, martha is on our zoom tonight and she's a very active uh participant at morvan mm -hmm. so um just you have heard of her okay yes oh absolutely of course yeah. oh yeah yeah i don't again i haven't done a lot of work in her I, my work tends to be on the earlier side of of early america um Wheatley and before. So I tend to look, and I tend to look at more narrative stuff generally. I like um, the work of um, um, Sarah Kemmel Knight. I look at, um, I've done some work in Anne, Anne Bradstreet, um, William Byrd. Um, yeah, my own tendencies are more toward, toward prose fiction or prose narrative, uh, but I do a lot of work in Wheatley too. But oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, she's, um, she's terrific. I mean, did, didn't, did she correspond with with Stockton? Uh, you know what? I can ask Martha to unmute. Uh, we don't normally have right yeah, this I this time, but um, I don't know about Stockton, but mm -hmm. I think um, Adams with um, uh, John Adams. But, you know, the famous Adams. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Abigail. That's right. Abigail. Abigail. Oh, that's so funny. That's Abigail right. and Mercy. There and you Mercy go. lived in Plymouth. They, right. The Otis family settled on like oh, Plymouth so Rock. That's and right. Then they moved to Boston. Right. And I think her papers are in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I can't understand the poetry, oh. but she was classically trained. She was, you know, satire and, and so on. Yeah. It's oh, so yeah, satire. 
Satire. Satire. It's so funny. This just came up recently because I was actually doing a uh, doing a talk, and one of the people I was looking at was Abigail Adams, and I actually taught this in my class recently. Um, I'm doing a course on early America, and when when Abigail writes that famous letter to John and says, "Remember the ladies," right? She's like, "Remember the ladies when you're drawing up your new right. government." And right. Adams writes back this kind of snarky, well, you're kind of being kind of snippy here, but I'm not going to reprimand you. And Abigail writes to Mercy Otis Warren and says, what a jerk he is. Isn't that great? <laughs> it's you, what, they were you, people. Exactly. They were human beings. She's hysterical. She's like, can you believe I wrote to him? And this is what he wrote back to me. What a jerk. And right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. They were all, They were good friends. Well, Abigail had a lot of correspondence, too. But, um, right. yeah, I don't, that, yeah, they, she never crossed paths with Wheatley that I know of. And I don't know, right. I think I'm getting my stock. So my she hat. was the sister of James Otis. Oh, who okay. we all heard about who up mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. And, okay. you know, he, he died before things really got ripping in the war. But he, right. Uh, right. actually, they say yeah. he got struck by lightning. But oh, it's wow. where the Budnots and, the, you know, I mean, I mean it, it's it's exciting yeah. stuff, but it's hard to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Through yeah. classical, from classically trained <laughs> Yeah, people, you know. Um, well, I just have a question. I hope I can ask it. I think you can hear me. Wasn't it unusual for this black woman, brilliant, genius woman, to be mm -hmm. given the name of Wheatley? Wasn't that the name of her family? Or yeah. Was yeah. yeah, no, it was often, they would often give the last name of the family just to, to uh, mark their ownership. In fact, her first name came from the boat that she was brought over on. It was called the Phyllis. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah. No, they they would often. In fact, that's why so many, um, so many um, former slaves changed their names when they when they came. Of they course, left, they yeah. get rid of, of the course. names because the name marked you as as a possession. So they would often not use the last name. I mean, it would not often. It would normally be you would refer to somebody by their first name, but in in like well, they had to give her a last name for publication purposes. So. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, that seems very unusual and great to me. Yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, I don't think too, there aren't a lot of examples of people who had a public facing persona. So that's interesting. I'd have to look at the, and I think they're, I'm pretty sure they're available to look at sort of the, the ownership manifest from the Wheatleys and whether they actually gave the last name to everybody else. But I think technically you were, you were property. So you were, you were a Wheatley, but couldn't do anything with that name it had no legal implications for anything but no interesting oh that's well, so funny well you. this is so wonderful i'm so delighted i met an ancestor of mercy yes you Warren. did i'm very excited <laughs> uh, me too <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so exciting well thank you all and thank you jeffrey and mary this has really been a fascinating evening and i am going to share the links and um documents actually everyone has the poems uh but we'll send out yeah. again and we appreciate so much that you're here for our finale of Poetry Palooza. I hope everyone's you know raising some grog. You gave us some great beverage recipes too. To oh yeah, oh, right. <laughs> said, nope. yeah. and perhaps you, perhaps we'll have you again you know for another program because honestly you know we are finding so much when you, when you talk about the the uh, enslaved names and things like that. We're always finding new scholarship mm -hmm. and there's always so much to learn. I mean history is now you know yes. so uh, and and poetry is now so so thank you both so so very much and so everyone much. have a wonderful evening thank you too thank you, thank you so much for having us thank you